Well, I want to take a few moments, and I want to, we're going to look at a story that we find in 2 Samuel, but before that, I want to give you a little bit of the backstory, and probably most of you know the majority of this, but I want to talk a little bit about King David, but before that, I want to talk about the dynamic between uh, Saul and David. Da- uh, David, as a young boy, if you know the story at all, he, uh, he, gets, he gets anointed to be the next king. And uh, he, out of all of his brothers, they all thought one of the other brothers would be anointed. They, uh, Dad keeps him out in the field, not even thinking of that he would be the choice. David comes in, gets anointed. He's anointed, but he's not king yet. So he has to kind of go through this waiting period. Well, in that waiting period, there's a lot of stories that if you grew up in the church or familiar with church, that you would know the David and Goliath story, some of those stories. Uh, but eventually, David ends up in the palace with Saul. And Saul begins to get jealous of David. David becomes a mighty warrior and is winning battles. And so people are singing songs about him and they're, they're talking about him. And so he starts to get jealous. And, and when Saul first becomes the king, he's actually a pretty good king. But over time, he starts to believe his own, his own uh, press, so to speak. And so he starts to think he's bigger than he actually is. And so he stops following God and just starts doing his own thing. And now he becomes jealous of David. And so there's even like a story where David's playing the harp in the, in the, uh, in the palace and, and Saul chucks a spear at him and tries to kill him. David goes into hiding. All of these take, things take place. And in the middle of that, though, David becomes best friends with, with Saul's uh, son, Jonathan. And they are like, they are super close. Jonathan is David's armor bearer. And we see throughout scripture, there's all these different opportunities where, where Jonathan just uh, steps in and, and is his right-hand man. Now we're going to ta- talk about a story that we find that's quite, late, quite a bit later on. David is already established as king. He's been at, on the throne for a while. We know that Saul and, and Jonathan are actually both dead by now by the time we read this story. So I want to look at this story for just a few moments. It's quite a bit of scripture. So if you'll just bear with me as we read through this. It says this, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9. One day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. He summoned a man named Ziba who had been in Saul's, one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. In Lodabar, Ziba told him, at the home of Maker, Make, Makar and Amiel. So David sent for him and brought him from Makir's house. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground, deep with respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David asked. Or David said, I intend to show kindness to you um, of my, because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat with, here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba replied, yes, my lord, the king, I am your servant and I will, I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. From then on, all the members of Ziba's household were Mephibosheth's servants. And Mephibosheth, uh, they just say his name a lot in here. Did you notice that? Can you turn to your neighbor and say Mephibosheth? Okay. Or don't do it, whatever, whichever, whatever you want to do, that's fine. Uh, who was crippled with both feet, lived in Jerusalem, and ate regularly at the king's table. So I want to look at this story for just a few moments because I think there's something pretty incredible about this. If we look at what happened prior to this, Saul was not a nice man to David. He was actually quite evil to David. 
And David was faithful in, in what God had laid on his heart to do. And, but as we see this story unfold, David is now in this position where he is the king. He is in charge. And one day he just says, hey, you know what? Is there anybody from, from Jonathan's house, which is Saul's house, that I can just show some kindness to? And so as we look at this story, we see that, that David is basically what he's done is he said, hey, this guy that was evil to me, this guy that was an enemy to me, Saul, I'm going to extend grace because he doesn't even just say from Jonathan's house. He says from Saul's house. So it could have been Jonathan's son or it could have been a son from another, uh, from another uh, uh, son or, or wife. And so he, he extends grace and he says, listen, I'm going to go and I want to find this guy and I want to extend grace to him. This is an amazing story because it is such a reflection of God in our lives. Because here is a king who has an enemy, and instead of, instead of saying, hey, if there's anybody that's left from Saul's family, I want us to wipe them out. I want to take care of every last one of them. I don't want that bloodline to continue. No, instead of that, he does the exact opposite, and he says, listen, I want to show grace. I want to, I want to give them something. So I, as I was thinking about this story, I was brought to Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. It says this, once you are alienated from God, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to, pre to pre present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So prior to accepting Christ, we are enemies of God. Now, I don't know if you realize that or not, but we are, we are not sons and daughters. We are not children of God. We are enemies of God. And so when we accept Christ, this amazing thing happens where we get to be called a son and a daughter of God. But as we look at this story, we see the picture of the king of kings showing kindness to us even when we are not his children. We're his enemies. So I love, I love scripture because scripture has a way of mirroring itself. We see in the Old Testament, and then we see it in the New Testament. We see it unfold in a story in the Old, and then all of a sudden we see Jesus in, the, in a picture, and, and, and it looks very similar to what we read in the Old Testament. That's why it's so dangerous these days when we see churches trying to do away with, with parts of Scripture. Amen? I'm, I'm grateful that I'm standing in a house that I know believes the, the book cover to cover. Right? We got, we got, we, not only do we need to do that, we need to instill that to our children. Because it's becoming very popular, right, to white out parts of Scripture, to try and make, make it a little easier to swallow. I mean, you know, we don't get to edit the book, right? I, I think God did what he needed to do. I think he, he gave us what we needed. And, and when we begin to edit it, we put ourselves into a seat that we should never put ourselves into. So as we're looking at this, we see that uh, Mephibosheth, is, is he's in Lodabar, and he's, he's in this in this place where life has been really hard on him. As we look at this story, though, what I want us to understand is sometimes we can get to a place where I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in God's grace. I mean, you know, if it wasn't for God's grace, none of us would be here. Amen? Like, there, I, some of you in this room, you've been a believer for a long time. You've served God. You've served him well. You've done, you've done everything you can. You do your best to, to be as, as right on as you possibly can. But I'll, I'll guarantee you right now, there's not one of us in this room, not one of us within the sound of my voice, that has lived a perfect life. Not one of us has, has lived sin-free. So because of that, we need a Savior. We need Jesus. And, but what can happen is this grace message that I love to preach. Anytime I get to preach about grace, I'm excited because people love to hear it too, right? Like, hey, I'm a mess and God loves me still. That's a great message because it's true. But inside of that, sometimes the grace message can almost make God look a little weak and spineless. And let me explain why I say that. Because I think sometimes with the grace message, what it looks like is God is so desperate to have you be his friend that he'll just put up with anything that you do. How many of you had those kind of people, those kind of friends like in junior high school, right? Like, like, or maybe you were that friend. Like you would do anything that the person wanted just so that they would be your friend. 
so desperate that you want a friend that they can mistreat you, they can, they can talk bad about you, they can push you, they can do all those things, and you'll just keep coming back because you're just so desperate in need of a friend. Can I tell you, the king of kings is not desperate today. He is not, he's not somebody that's weak. He's not somebody who's a pushover. He's not somebody who just is in heaven going, you know what, they can do whatever they want as long as they still love me. No, that's not who he is. So I, I want us to be cautious in that because I think it's important for us to understand how, how great our God is. And I think it's awesome that we were singing that this evening before I got up here. He does extend his great compassion and mercy towards us, however. But don't ever mistake his kindness for weakness because it's not weakness. So to sum it up, we see that God has every right to take you out except for the reconciliation that comes through Christ Jesus. So if you're in the house today and you, and you don't, you, maybe you're new to church or this is maybe even your first time or, or you've been coming for a little while trying to figure this thing out, the amazing thing about our God is that he, he loves us so much that he sent his only son to die on a cross because there had to be a price that was paid for our mess. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a mess. I mess up regularly. I sin, I screw up, I do stupid. Now, I'm guessing that all of us are kind of in that same boat, that we make mistakes regularly. So because of that, an, an imperfect person could never enter into the presence of a perfect God because as soon as we did, we'd make him imperfect. But because he loved us so much, he sent Jesus to die on a cross and he said, with that sacrifice being made and us accepting that sacrifice, now all of a sudden we have the ability to be in the presence of God. That's amazing. As we look at this story that we just were reading, it's so similar and it's such a foreshadowing of what takes place because there's a covenant that was made between God the Father and God the Son when Jesus stretched out his hands on Calvary. And we place our faith in Christ and we become part of that covenant. It's kind of like the covenant that David made with Jonathan. So David made this covenant with Jonathan saying, hey, I'm gonna look out for your family. And so because of Jonathan, Mephibosheth, got blessed. Well, because of Jesus, you and I get blessed. Because of the covenant that God and Jesus had, because of that, we have the ability to, to believe in what Jesus did on the cross and then to walk that out. And all of a sudden, now we get set at the king's table. Look at David calls Mephibosheth to show him kindness. And he says, it's for Jonathan's sake. So when we call on the name of Jesus, then all of a sudden we stop being an enemy of God and we start sitting at his table as a child of God. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty incredible. It's not because we're good. It's because he's good. It's not because of anything that we could ever do. It's because of something he already did. And that's amazing. So I want us to continue to look at this story for just a few moments. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, Verse 3, this, we already read this earlier, but it says, The king asked, Is there anyone left from the family of Saul to whom I can show some godly kindness? And Ziba told the king, Yes, there's Jonathan's son, and he's lame in both feet. So I want us to go back in the story a little bit, because earlier in, the, in 2 Samuel chapter 4, we see, we see Mephibosheth come onto the scene, and it says this. It says, Jonathan, son of, of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet, he was five years old when the news came about Saul and Jonathan, uh, came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. So here we have, earlier in the story, word comes down that both Saul and Jonathan are dead, and so the one watching Jonathan's son realizes, I don't know what this is going to look like because now Saul is gone, Jonathan is gone, there could be an overturning of what we know. And so she immediately grabs Mephibosheth and she begins to run. And as she begins to run, she drops him. And from then on, he's paralyzed. Now, as we look at this story, what I want you to understand is that there was someone that was charged for caring for this little boy and they dropped him. Maybe you sit in the room today and someone who was supposed to take care of you dropped you. Maybe somebody who was supposed to look out for you did not do what they were charged with to do. 
Maybe you've, maybe you've experienced things in your life like sexual abuse or emotional scars. Maybe your dad left when you were young or your husband or your wife decided to give up on your marriage. Someone who was supposed to be there dropped you. You ever watch how people get dropped, when people get dropped, how they end up oftentimes dropping other people later in life? We say it like this, hurt people will hurt people, right? So somebody who's been hurt as a child will oftentimes grow up and not understand how to not hurt other people. So we look at this story, and here's a young man who, who at, at one point was living as, as his, his grandpa was the king, his, his dad was in the army, I mean, just had a good life going, and then all of a sudden everything changes, and the person that was supposed to care for him all of a sudden drops him. So for us, as we sit in this room today, what I want you to understand is Mephibosheth was there. He was in this place where, where he had been dropped, and now his whole world changed. This is a young man that in, in the time in the society that he lived in, that he grew up in, if you would have been a cripple back then, you had zero choices of what you could do. Here's your choice. You're a beggar. That's it. So Mephibosheth went from being a, 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 chi- a grandchild of the king to being a beggar on the street because somebody dropped him. Some of you may sit in this room today and you may be in a position where your life has not turned out the way that you thought it would because somebody else dropped you at some point. I see it all the time. We have a lot of people that come out to our church that come from very messy backgrounds. We, we have a lot of people that will come from, from uh, addiction and those kinds of things. And, and as you dig into their story, oftentimes you'll find that it's somebody who at some point in their life got dropped. Somebody didn't meet the expectation of what, what they needed when they were younger. And so out of that, they've, they've just begun to live a life that they were never intended to live. I want to challenge you in the room today, if you're here and and you are somebody who has been dropped, to stop the cycle of dropping. We can do it because we we serve a God who can break a cycle. He can break generational things. He can break things that, that have hurt us in the past. He can heal wounds from inside of us. And for some of you, you're like, man, this is stuff that I don't really like to talk about. Uh, you know, I just I just muscle through it. I'll be fine. I'll get to the other side. It'll be okay. Sometimes we feel like, especially for those of us men in the room, we feel as though if we were to ever talk about that kind of stuff, it actually makes us feel like we're weak. But I, I just want to challenge you today that, that understanding if you've been dropped, if something's happened in your life, if there's something that happened to you as a child or something that's happened to you even as an adult that you struggle with, it's okay to acknowledge that thing because then you can bring it to a God who can heal you of it. Maybe you, maybe you find yourself struggling with anger because you were raised around anger. Maybe you abuse because you were abused. Maybe you lie because you were lied to. When parents drop you, when friends drop you, when religion, religious institutions drop you, God is always there and wants to pick you up. Your dysfunction doesn't have to define your destiny. Oftentimes we live in a time right now where, where you'll hear people will use their, their past, their mistakes, their, the time they got dropped, they'll use it as an excuse to continue down a road. And I'm telling you right now that the God of the universe loves you so much that he sees you and he says, I have plans and dreams and desires for you. And even though you got dropped, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to live there anymore. So I want to look at this story for just a few more moments because we see that uh, Mephibosheth is in Lodabar, which is a city in Manasseh, and the name of that city actually means no pasture. Uh, It can mean no word. It can mean no communication. Well, God has a promise for us in Psalm 23 too that says uh, that we will rest in green pasture. So as we look at this, now Mephibosheth, they, they exile to a place that means no pasture. And pasture is defined in the dictionary as a gr- uh, green grass or vegetation eaten as food by grazing animals. So it's ir- ironic that this place, Lodabar, also means no word, which is the spiritual food that you and I would eat is God's word, right? So as we look at this story, maybe you find yourself 
today in Lodabar. You find yourself in a place of exile. You find yourself in a place where you are constantly feeling less than. You're feeling as though you're never, you're never feeling fulfilled in your life. God doesn't want you to live there. He doesn't want you to stay there. I love this part of the story because he, they, they take him somewhere where it's low-key, where nobody will know that, that Mephibosheth is even there. They can just kind of live under the radar and kind of hide away. And the king says, is there someone? So they go and they find him. They go to Lodabar, to this place that nobody, it's this unassuming place, and they go and, and they go to, to get Mephibosheth and I think it's cool because the king says, I don't want you to live there anymore. I think that for many of us, even as believers, those of us who have accepted Christ into our life, we often, we often live in places that God never intended us to live. Sometimes we have a hard season, we have a hard thing happen to us or whatever, and we end up changing our address. Well, I'm telling you right now, God wants you to change your address back. He wants to bring you back home. He wants to bring you back to where you rightfully belong. Because for all of us, no matter what our backstory is, we are all crippled by a condition that we call sin. And out of that, we have got to come to a place where we understand that it's only through the relationship with Jesus Christ that we can be reconciled to the king. But how cool is it that the king in this story would 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 send somebody to go and find somebody in a place called Lodabar, a place of exile, a place that that nobody would want to be. And he says, not only do I want you to go find him, he could have just found him and said, hey, I want to give you a couple hundred bucks. Like, hey, I like your, your, you know, your your dad was a good friend of mine. And even though your your grandpa was my enemy, I'm making good on all this. And I just want, but no, he says, I want you to bring him back. Because from now on, he's going to come and he's going to eat at my table. See, God is a God who is like, you, sometimes we go, man, I've messed up so many times and I've screwed up in my life and I've made so many mistakes that, that I'm just grateful that God lets me come into church. Like, I'm, I'm glad that, that lightning doesn't strike me when I come into the house, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, and, but that's not, some of you are pointing to other people. Uh, <laughs> Um, anyhow, but, uh, but that's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve is a God who says, listen, not only do I not want you to live in Lodabar, I'm going to bring you to the palace. And it's not even, he could have said, I'll bring you to a pa- the palace and you can come in every once in a while, but I'll get you a nice little house just outside of the city. And, and then I'll feel good about what I did. No, he said every, every meal you can come and you can sit at the king's table. You can be a part of the family. Now, Mephibosheth, when he, when he first was approached, he said, what, what would you want to do with a, with a dirty dog like me? Why would you want anything to do with me? I don't know about you, but I, I'm guessing that some of you in the room today can relate. Like maybe the first time that you heard the salvation message, the first time you heard that the God of the universe wants relationship with you, maybe that's how you felt inside. What would you want with a dirty dog like me? Why would you want anything to do with me? God, you know me. You know what I've done. Why would you have anything to do with me? And that's how Mephibosheth felt. But in the, in the middle of this, what we need to understand is the God of the universe, uh, he will carry you to his table. I think it's awesome. I loved worship today. I love that all these kids were down here. And I know for some of you parents, it was unnerving, maybe a little bit. But I loved it. Because I think, I think there's something so powerful about our children being raised to watch parents worship, to see worship, to hear the word, to, to be in a place where truth is spoken, right? I, I mean, I grew up in church. My dad was a pastor, and so we had Sunday morning two services, and we had Sunday night church, and, and I remember sleeping on the pew while my, while my uh, mom was in prayer and, and, and stuff was happening after church. And I think it's so important because we have a generation that is being dropped right now. We have a generation that is being raised to believe things that are not true. 
We have a generation right now that they go to school, and, and I don't know that it matters in this, in this city what school you go to, but they're being asked to give their pronouns. Now, I don't, I, listen, I don't, I'm not going to get all political on you. I'm assuming that I, I, I can say some things. You got, like, you got animals all over your walls in this place, so <laughs> I'm guessing that I'm fairly safe. But we, we've got to pay attention because we can't let a generation get dropped. We can't stand idly by while, uh, while this generation gets fed a bunch of lies. It's amazing to me to, me to watch how things that were, were absolute truth. Now the world is, is twisting things and things that, that we know to be true are being seen as lies and things that we know to be lies are being taught as truth. And we sit and we, and we don't really, we're, the church has got to find its voice again. And we've got to start speaking into that. And, and for parents, those of you with young children, pay attention. Pay attention to what they're bringing home from school. Pay attention to what the teachers are teaching. We have some great teachers in this community. We've got some great teachers. You probably have teachers that go to this church. We have great teachers that go to our church. I'm not saying all teachers, so please don't hear me wrong. But there are some teachers that have an agenda, and we've got to pay attention because this generation will get dropped, and they will, it will cripple them. The king will still always welcome them to the table, but we need to have a generation that is raised to understand what truth is. The thing that's amazing about this story is that uh, the, the king not only calls him to the table, but he brings him out from exile. I, this evening, I, I guess I just really want you to, to understand this because I feel like there are some of us that have been in the church maybe even for a while, and we have, we have been dropped, and we have, we have a little bit of a limp because we've been hurt in some ways. I think that one of the things that I, I find out a lot uh, as a pastor is there's a lot of people who have been hurt by the church. A lot of, the, obviously people get hurt at home and, and whatever, but there's a, I deal with a lot of people who will come to church and then they'll begin to share with me their hurt that happened when they were a kid or even as an adult, how they were mistreated by somebody in the church and how it's affected their view of who God is. And as we look at this story, I hope that you get a clear picture of who the God is that we serve because he is a God who, who will, will seek you and find you and bring you from exile and bring you to his table. The other thing about this story that's amazing to me is, you know, in, in that day, to sit at the king's table meant you were eating the best of the best. Like, you got to sit and, and, and it didn't matter. I mean, you got, there was excess and you could just sit and you could have your, your potatoes with your sour cream. And you could just, you could load it up if you wanted to. And, uh, and all of those things. And so he's sad that I sat at his table. Um, I, literally, man, that was so great. But I've never seen anybody eat sour cream with potatoes the way that you did. That was so good. <laughs> there was very little potato and a lot of sour cream from what I could see. But, but that's good. Uh, but at the king's table, you can have as much sour cream as you want. It, it, it's, it's unending sour cream. Uh. <laughs> they, uh. But a lot of times for us, the, those of us who say, hey, I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, we live our lives in such a way where we, we act as though we have to settle for the scraps under the table. I say this to a lot of times when, uh, when we'll have conversations with especially young ladies that go to our church who are single and they'll be saying, oh, I'm looking for a guy, I'm looking for whatever. And, and I, will, I will say to them regularly, don't you forget who you are. Don't forget that you're a child of the Most High King. Don't you forget that you're a princess and that you don't have to settle for the scraps under the table because he's got a seat for you at the table. And I'd say that to all of us today too, that for many of us, we live our Christian existence as though we've got to just kind of settle for whatever. And I'm telling you right now, the God that we serve is so good and he loves you so much that even if you were dropped as a child, even if you were dropped as an adult, even if you've been hurt in some way, he is a, he is a God who seeks you and he finds you and he wants to bring you out of exile and he wants to bring you to a seat at his table because he wants to show you that the importance of who you are through him. 
Mephibosheth didn't earn a right to be at that table. He did nothing. But he was Jonathan's son, and because of that, he got to sit at the table. For you and I, it's not because of of anything like that, but it's because we say yes to Jesus Christ. And when we say yes to him, then all of the things that are available to a son of the Most High God and a daughter of the Most High God become available to us. Here's my challenge. I really want to encourage you this evening because I do know that we live in a time, your, your pastor and I talk about it on almost a weekly basis, about what a difficult time it is to live right now. It's such a hard time to be the church. It's tough because everything is pushing against it. Everything is pushing against our belief system and everything is pushing against even us gathering. There's so many things that are pushing hard against this. But for us as believers, if we would just take hold of this and begin to understand that the God that we serve is in control. Did you know that? He's in control. Even though this world feels a little out of control, there's never been a moment that God's like, oh man, that happened. I didn't expect that to happen. He knows it. He knows it all. And if we're his kids and we get a seat at the table, then guess what? We don't need to be worried about all this stuff. We just need to, we need to stand firm. We need to be who he's calling us to be. Amen? I love this church. I love, your pastor brags on you guys all the time, and I love just the, the heart of this. The, the family feel of this church is amazing. Like even just sitting back there and, and eating a meal with you and watching kids run around and, and parents and grandparents and generations and all that stuff, and, and we can't lose that we got to fight, and we got to stand up, and we got to understand that there is an enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, and he wants to do everything that he can to push against this and to, and to convince us that we're weak and we're unable and, and that everything's going to go in this direction and there's nothing we can do about it, but I'm telling you right now, you have a seat at the table, and the king is powerful. The king's table that we get to set at is the king above all kings. And he is able.